So thank you, Michelle. Hi, Managing Editor of American Purpose. I'm Jeff Gedman with American Purpose. Welcome to all of you. It's great to see. I'm seeing Shirley Craig Kennedy from our board, Patrick Chamorel, of course, co-founder and chair of our editorial board, Frank Fukuyama out at Stanford. Welcome to everybody. This is a one hour program concluding at 1 p.m. Eastern. And it's my pleasure to welcome Fareed Zakaria, our guest of honor, who, as you know, but I do note, and it's important to note, is the host of CNN's very popular program, uh, Fareed Zakaria's GPS. He's a regular columnist with the Washington Post. He's a book author and essayist. He's a former editor of Newsweek International. He's a former managing editor of Foreign Affairs, holds a PhD in political science from Harvard. He was a student of Sam <laughs> Huntington's. And for purposes of this conversation today and near and dear to American purpose, our mission, our community, he is a prolific writer on democracy, liberal democracy, illiberal democracy. I note at the top and remind you of a 1997 essay in foreign affairs on this subject, much quoted and debated, a 2003 book on the future of freedom, illiberal democracy at home and abroad, and many other things, too many things to cite. I'm going to ask you all a handful of questions about Freed's writings on this subject area. To get us started, we'll go maybe 20 minutes before I open it up to the gallery, because there are so many people of remarkable experience and deep knowledge. I won't stand in your way, but I will get us started. So first, Fareed, thank you so much. Welcome, and it's great to see you. It's a huge pleasure to be here with you, Jeff, and uh, to be with in such distinguished company. So thank you. I'm going to start <clears throat> with, with basics and terms, Fareed, because it seems to me that clarity around language is essential and that today as before, but today perhaps increasingly, we have debates that are confused because oftentimes we're talking about different things. So let's start with basics. Liberalism, democracy, two things that are often conflated. How do you define them? Then say a word about liberal democracy and illiberal democracy to see if we can begin as a group with a basis and common understanding of language and concepts. Yeah, that's a great place to start, uh, Jeff, because you're right, people do uh, mix things up. And so from, for the purposes of trying to understand what is going on in the world, I think it is very important to understand that there is a difference between democracy and liberalism. Democracy, basically, if you look at it from the oldest definitions, which come out of Herodotus and the Greeks, uh, means, a government of the people in some sense or the other. And generally speaking, what that has tended to mean is political participation, voting. Um, that is the core, that is the essence of what defines democracy. Um, to to you know, give you a sense, when people talked about it in ancient Greece, that, that was all they were talking about. They were not talking about the quality of the government, the nature of the government outside of that one feature. Liberalism is a, is a different tradition uh, which really was about the limitation of the power of the state and the enhancement of the power of the individual. Thus, liberty, you know, it derives from the Latin libertas. And, you know, the kind of uh, conventional view of this would be, which is not entirely inaccurate, uh, is that Magna Carta is the beginning of this kind of what I call constitutional liberalism to emphasize that it has a kind of legal element to it, which is the, you know, the, the, this is a point at which uh, the, the barons of England get together with King John and essentially ask him to limit his own power. It was in, in, in its original conception, it was a, it was a charter of baronial privilege uh, rather than something for the rights of common men or, and women, but it limited the power of the state for the first time in a systematic, institutionalized uh, ma ma uh, manner. And so when you look at the development of Europe, what you see is that tradition of liberalism grows slowly, um, not necessarily tied to democracy. I mean, though the two are cousins. Uh, so you can look in 
1815 at Britain, uh, which by then is being called widely the most liberal state in Europe. Um, Voltaire, Montesquieu, all these people pointed to, uh, to, to Britain as being the place where individual liberty was flourishing the most freely. Uh, Britain was allowing, I think it was 4% or 3% of the population to vote in 1815. The, you know, the first Reform Act only expands it to about 3%. So you can see the distinction between the two. Um, what has happened in the last 50 or 60 years is after World War II, these two traditions merge somewhat seamlessly in the West. And so we think of liberal democracy as being natural. But as you can look, as you can see, when you look at uh, countries like Turkey today, Poland today, Hungary today, India today, you are seeing these two strands, liberalism and democracy, that were so tightly woven or so seemingly tightly woven, beginning to come apart. So that in India, you have a very popular uh, prime minister who is systematically and legally discriminating, persecuting, you know, Christians, Muslims, uh, throwing out, uh, intimidating the media in various ways, clamping down on the media. In, in, in uh, uh, Turkey, that tradition has gone even further. In Hungary, I would say it's closer to the India uh, model, but everywhere you see it. And of course, at some level, what Trump represents is a, is a, is a manifestation of illiberal democracy. Because Trump is clearly popular, whether or not he has a majority is, is besides the point, but he's popular enough that by American rules, he was able to get elected in 2016. And many of the things he, he did, I think a lot of people would argue, were contrary to the tradition of constitutional liberalism. So even in the oldest constitutional democracy in the world, you see this tension between liberalism and democracy. So, so we're going we're gonna to go forward and we're going to look at the international scene, you've already opened that front up, but, but let me go back just for a moment for scene setting and foundational purposes. The United States and the founders, did they tend to speak or speak of liberalism, democracy, or a republic? And according to which, why? Yeah, no, entire, the, the founders were clearly uh, aware of this distinction. Uh, and that is why they very consciously created a republic, not a democracy. For them, the democracy was the Greek form of government that had almost always devolved into chaos or tyranny. Um, and of course, when we talk about the founders as a spectrum, there were people like Hamilton who thought that, you know, really needed some kind of a monarchy. Um, but I think that the most influential founder uh, for these matters was James Madison. And so probably if we focus on him, we see where, where the core of the founding project was. And that was essentially a distrust of direct democracy, of too much democracy. And so very much recognizing the need for democracy and for popular participation, uh, but uh, taming it in various ways to preserve liberalism, to preserve liberty. So when people talk about the America, the constitution, it's important to remember that the first 10 amendments to the constitution are all limitations on democracy. You know, in other words, what does the first amendment say? What does the second amendment say? No matter what the majority wants, these are the things you cannot do. You cannot abrogate, abridge freedom of speech, uh, religion, right to bear arms. All these things are limitations on democracy. So the core in some ways of the constitution was a limitation on democracy. And it comes out of Madison's famous uh, 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 dictum, which is the most difficult thing to do is you have to first get the government to be able to control the governed, and then you have to get it to control itself. That is his famous for formulation in the Federalist Papers. And that second dictum, getting the government to control itself is at the heart of the American constitutional project. So thank you. So we're going to move back forward, but before we get to the Trump and Trumpian moment and set of questions, uh, say a little bit about the following, if you would, Freed. You, you observe that after the Second World War, liberalism and democracy seem to join or come together seamlessly, 
And now we have this tension and stress and pulling apart. Before we go to people and personalities and leadership, say a word about the role of parties and also the role of informal mechanisms or intermediary associations. There's a history and context to this and those things seem to have evolved and they seem to be in trouble today, if you agree. Could you comment on that? Yeah, no, it's, a, it's an excellent question because I think what you're hinting at is that the, 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 this, this last 20 years and particularly this last five or six years may have exposed a flaw in the founding project, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the constitutional, American constitutional project. So to begin with, we were not supposed to have parties. You know, Washington hated the idea of parties. Madison hated the idea of parties. And the reason was that they did, they did not want some kind of um, alignment, coalition or group where the ideological or party loyalty or factional loyalty, Ma Madison's term was always factions, would be permanent and would, would, could override the other, um, the other loyalties within the constitution. So Madison could not have conceived of a situation that we have today in which the Republican party for the most part is placing party loyalty above institutional loyalty, right? The core of Madison's project is that uh, ambition is made to counteract ambition. Checks and balances mean that each institution checks the abuse of the other. Congress checks the power of the president and the Supreme Court, in a sense, checks the power of both. But what do you do when you have congressional Republicans who will not exercise the power, prerogatives, and checks of, of Congress, but rather will give a free pass to, their, to, the, to the guy who's their president? And this is not just a, a Trump phenomenon, but it's a phenomenon of the extreme polarization of the last 20 years. So I, I wonder at some level if that is a that exposes, and I'd love to hear what somebody like Frank Fukuyama thinks about this, exposes a real flaw in the constitutional project. You know, Madison was so proud of the idea that he had come up with a mechanism that didn't require that people act virtuously. But he says famously, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. But maybe that's not true. Maybe, maybe we need Mitch McConnell and Kevin McCarthy and people like that to act virtuously because they have redefined self-interest to mean whatever serves the interests of their narrow party political position rather than their congressional institutional position, which is what Madison always thought. You know, because he didn't believe in parties, he assumed all the factions would be constantly shifting and they'd always cancel each other out. But they're not. They have coalesced into two groups that owe each other enormous ideological loyalty. And to your final point uh, about uh, intermediate associations, so the one saving grace about this, uh, this last few years has been that certain guilds in America have maintained a certain professionalism and institutional loyalty that they have placed about party loyalty. So you notice that lawyers in general have been quite reluctant to go along with what would be ruling in the favor of the party rather than the law. And you can see this in uh, you know, the Justice Department. You can see it in the way judges throughout almost every one of uh, the, the, the challenges to the 2020 election. You can even see it in the way in which in the institutionalized bureaucracy, people like the Deputy Attorney General uh, under, in the Trump administration, finally even the Attorney General, Bill Barr, demurred from really bending the law to suit the political purposes. I'd, I'd argue you see this a little bit with journalism, that there are journalists who have tried to maintain some level of professionalism. Uh, it's, it, to my mind, it's a reminder you know, of Tocqueville's great uh, uh, observation about th these kinds of associations of how much they form the kind of inner stuffing of America and in the inner stuffing of democracy. But let me close on a slightly sour note. I worry a lot that these are these are institutions that have only so much resilience that when you batter at them and you batter at them and you batter at them, they will wear down. So were there to be a second Trump administration, 
and were he to clean out the Justice Department and, and appoint only Trump loyalists and clean out the FBI and clean out the CIA and clean out all these institutions that in some way stood up and said, we will not be used for purely uh, party political reasons. Would these institutions, you know, survive and last and, and flourish? I mean, I, I've always loved Emerson's line, you know, an institution is but a lengthened shadow of a man. Uh, if the men change, if the men prove to be virtue, uh, you know, without virtue, maybe those institutions don't don't mean as much as we we hope they would, they do. Oh, thank you, Fred. I'm going to ask one last question to open up the conversation a little bit. Uh, and then we'll turn to the gallery and, and perhaps Frank, if you were willing uh, first to weigh in. Um, you mentioned uh, professional journalism and journalists trying to maintain their craft and, and integrity. Uh, would you say a word about the importance of journalism and its state? It seems to me that social media is one phenomenon and one opportunity and set of problems, if you will, but, but also traditional or legacy media with what I would term a relentless hunt for eyeballs uh, and clicks becomes too, uh, I think, problematic. I remind you that 2016 of the head of CBS who said, Donald Trump may not be good for the country, but he's awfully good for our bottom line. What's changed? What's changing? And how do you assess that problem and that part of our democratic world that used to be holding power accountable? Uh, that's, a, that's a very big subject and I'm not sure, you know, I have anything that profound to say about it, but, but I make just a few observations. First, um, it's important to remember that the, the image we have of the media uh, that you know, we nostalgically go back to uh, is a very particular uh, historically situated image. It is the image we have of the media circa, let us say, the 1973, 1974, the high water mark of Watergate. And what it is, is a, it's, it's a cartel. It's three networks. It's three or four newspapers. It's two news magazines. And those 10 media institutions controlled the bandwidth uh, through which Americans consume news. Uh, and as a result, because they had this very large audience, they tended to play it pretty straight and pretty, pretty much, you know, to the, toward the center, focus uh, mostly on, on facts. Um, that then starts to disaggregate. And it disaggregates to the point of craziness now where you have you know, thousands and thousands. But here's the important thing to understand, which is the, the, the 40 or 70 million people, whatever number you want to choose, that were watching the three major network muses. You say to yourself, what has happened to them? You know, it's all become narrow cast. Yes, but the most important thing to understand about that is that the majority of those people who watch the evening news are no longer watching news on television. They're watching sports, they're watching entertainment, they're watching Showtime, Bravo, Netflix. You know, in other words, those people were watching the news, if one can be honest, because it came between Oprah Winfrey and their favorite sitcom. And there were only three channels and they didn't, they were too lazy to get up and change the remote and, and to turn the TV or the, the, the room, remote. So you had a trapped audience that watched uh, political news and got a kind of centrist narrative. Now those people have gone. They are essentially apolitical or, or not very political. And what's left are the junkies. The junkies are the people watching news. And that's, if you add up CNN, MSNBC, and Fox's audience, it's under 10 million people in a country of 340 million people. So it's a very small but very influential, noisy, junky crowd that is naturally extreme, partisan. Those are the people who get riled up about it. That's, those are the people who are, you know, the, it, it's in a sense, it's the angry political activists who are now dominating this, you know, this, this debate. So that's part of the problem. The other part of the problem is um, 
media is a for-profit organization. You know, so when people say, make it out that there's this huge bias here or there or, or the other, yeah, I mean, of course, most liberal, most journalists are liberals, for sure. But the most important imperative is sensationalism. Just keep people watching, as you said, about Donald Trump. Uh, I mean, if you were to choose between a Hillary Clinton campaign speech and a Donald Trump campaign speech, you know, as somebody who dislikes Donald Trump intensely, I would watch Trump. He's much more entertaining. He's compelling TV. Um, and if and if I didn't put him on as CNN, somebody else would, and the eyeballs would move there, right? So you you don't have that control uh, left. So, so we're living in a world of completely disaggregated media in which narrow casting becomes the only goal. You know, the only number people you can get are the junkies. And in that context, how do you create a rational, sober, uh, civilized dialogue that achieves the kind of high-minded purposes you, you talk about? I don't know. I mean, I try on my show, but I know that that's a, that, that that is a, you know, that's one show. I know that in general, it's very hard. And I know in general, you're not going to get those people back, that broad center, those, those people who are, you know, who even vote but they're just not interested in watching the news for hours and hours a day. And yet that is what it's, it's the same problem we have with Twitter. A small minority of people use Twitter. Um, they, however, they overshadow the vast silent majority or you know, the, the majority that are not on Twitter. Um, and so that to me is the challenge in the age of social media. It's, it goes well beyond social media. It is this problem of a highly disaggregated, decentralized media in which the intensity of, of your interest is far more important than your numbers. It's a, in a strange way, American democracy at this level has become a, a minority rule, not majority rule. The rule of passionate and intense minorities rather than majorities. Frank calls this vitocracy, referring to the kind of way in which special interests run Congress, but it's now become a broader phenomenon even within the social political culture uh, writ large. So Freed, thank you and dear colleagues, I wanna open it up now. It's 12.30 Eastern, 30 minutes before our hard stop. Over to you, if you would raise your hand or use the raise hand function in Zoom, identify yourself if I call on you. Michelle, if I miss you, uh, Michelle will tell me where you are and call on you. And so the floor is open. And uh, with no obligation, I'm gonna to turn to you, Frank, first, if you wish to weigh in because Fried cited you, but uh, over to you if you wish, or you can oh, pass sure. and wait a bit. Great, thank you. Right, yeah, so Fried, I've written a book called Liberalism and its Discontents that will be out in April or May or so, uh, which really is a defense first of liberal institutions rather than democratic ones uh, based on the distinction that you uh, very nicely made. So, um, you know, it's something to consider for your show when the time comes. Uh, but uh, I guess I had a couple of comments about what you said. The first has to do with the role of virtue in uh, the founding fathers thought and in our republic. And I'm not so sure that Madison's view was that the checks and balances would by themselves be sufficient to keep things going. Uh, there's this very important uh, transatlantic tradition of Republican republicanism uh, in you know that ultimately comes from Machiavelli's discourses about the you know the virtues of the Roman Republic that the founding fathers were quite aware of. And I sort of think that Madison's view was not that you know this check and balance mechanism would by itself be sufficient. Uh, I think what he was arguing was that virtue by itself is not sufficient and that you needed these institutional checks, but if you didn't have virtue, then the institutions wouldn't work either. And I think you can see that, right? I mean, if you get a subpoena uh, to appear before Congress uh, and you just refuse to show up, unless somebody actually compels you to do that, it's not gonna happen. And so there has to be a high degree of normative compliance uh, that, um, accompanies these formal institutional checks and balances, I think, for the system as a whole to work. And, and I, so I'm not sure that this is a contradiction within democracy. I think you just have to kind of expand the understanding of both the informal and formal institutions that are needed to make it work. I guess the other thing is that 
I do think that the uh, we tend to not give our institutions enough credit because they basically did function. And I think you cited a lot of examples of that. Uh, you know, the way I regard checks and balances is kind of like an insurance policy that uh, you make it hard for the government to take positive action because you're worried about a bad person running the government that will do bad things. But it also limits the ability of a good leader to do good things. And so we're seeing, you know, if you like Biden and his agenda right now, he's really frustrated because of the filibuster and, you know, these other constraints on his power. But those are the same things that prevented Trump from doing his worst. And I think that we as a democracy have chosen uh, more checks and balances than let's say a British Westminster system, uh, which is a safer position in a certain way because it cuts off certain bad things that could happen, but it also prevents good things from happening. And I think we're suffering from that, uh, suffering from that right now. And that's the vitocracy, you know, situation that I decried before Trump rose. I was very happy we had vitocracy while he was in power. And now, you know, I think it's become kind of problematic. So those are just some general comments. But in general, yeah, that was an excellent presentation. So thanks very much. Frank, th thank you. And then um, Michelle has kindly put in chat a link to Frank's essay, For Us, American Purpose, launching American Purpose last year on liberalism and its discontents. And that will give you a hint about the upcoming book. Uh, thank you, Frank. Azar, do you have your hand up? Yes, please. And you're muted. You're still muted, Azar. If you could press the... And then we'll go to John Mauch. Okay, uh, so... What I wanted to ask you, Farid, was, um, is there a different, I mean, what are the differences, if any, between illiberal democracy and totalitarianism? How would we define each of these? Uh, for example, we have Turkey, we have China, we have Iran. How would we differentiate or are they all uh, the same? Uh, I very much appreciate if you talk about that. Um, yeah, that's a great, it's a great question, particularly when you think about Iran, uh, but also uh, China, as you say. So when I think of illiberal democracy, and what I was thinking about when I wrote that essay, was places where there was a high degree of political participation, and there was a substantial degree of support for the person who has ended up in power, mm -hmm. uh, usually through an election. Um, if you look at India, if you look at Turkey, I mean, Turkey is a very good example. Whatever one may say, Erdogan keeps winning um, and he wins free, largely free and fair elections. There's a little bit of uh, monkeying with the rules, but let's not, let's not be too uh, demanding. After all, elections in the West until very recently, you know, if you go back to the 19th century, the 1920s and 30s, there was a lot of there was a lot of hanky panky. So Erdogan is by no, more normal democratic standards winning these elections. He's getting elected. But then he is destroying the free media. He is destroying the tradition of secularism in, in Turkey. He is destroying the protection of minority rights and things like that. Um, in India, is not as far behind as most, most people don't realize the degree to which India has moved in an illiberal direction. Uh, but it's really, you know, it looks very similar to Turkey. They're kicking out uh, NGOs. They're uh, persecuting Christians. They're, they've been persecuting Muslims on a very broad scale. Um, places like Iran and China, I think, are fundamentally autocracies. Their, their, their leadership did not come to power mm -hmm. through elections. Um, in the Iranian case, as you know far better than I, it is a highly controlled, manipulated uh, election process in which literally 90% sometimes of the eligible candidates are ruled out, uh, you know, are not given permission to run. So I think of that as a little bit more like the elections that take place in China or that took place in the Soviet Union, where they are really just the facade, but they are fundamentally a process of selection that is elite selection within an autocratic uh, uh, polity. 
um, but they are attentive to, to public opinion. So you're right to, to ask because even in those autocracies, they have learned something about the importance of public opinion management and such. The Chinese Communist Party does more polls probably than any organization in the world. Uh, the Iranians use those elections as a way of diffuse. It's almost like a valve, you know, where they they allow a certain amount of discontent out here and in there. Putin does something similar, but I do think they're fundamentally different because they are not actually allowing the leadership to be selected by by popular means, and as a result, they have a kind of strange and much more manipulated populism. So the, the Chinese Communist Party, Xi Jinping, is clearly appealing to the public in some ways with some of his uh, stuff, you know, the attack on big technology and such. But it's, but it's very different from the wave of, I think, democratic populism that, is, that, has been, uh, that has been sweeping the world. And that is much more, that comes out of a public that is feeling uh, the world is changing, you, we, you know, we're becoming more diverse, globalization is running amok, technology is running amok. I want somebody who will, who will protect me from all this. That, that is the impulse that is giving us the Donald Trumps of the world. Uh, so, so you're absolutely right. They're, they're, they exist in the same world and they are related, but I do think that they're fundamentally different. Thank you, Free. Thank you, Azhar. So I want to go to you, John, and I'll just give you all a heads up with 21 minutes to go. We'll go to Mark Platner, Nicole, Penn, Michael Allen, maybe Don Emerson. Hang in there, colleagues. Hang in there. But John, you first. Uh, hi, Fareed. It's, it's great to see you. Thank you for coming. Um, I wanted to ask how you would revise and change the future of freedom today. I'm sure it's a question you often get, but I guess that book's what, almost 20 years old? And it was a world where we thought the biggest threat was possibly radical Islam and maybe degeneracy of Western institutions, demosclerosis, that kind of thing. What do you think you got wrong and right? And most importantly, what would you change? Thanks, John. Um... So I think that, you know, if you look at the book, I, I do think, um, if I can say so myself, I, 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 I saw this, this phenomenon, the rise of illiberal democracy, pretty clearly and early and presciently, if I may again say so myself. Um, I did recognize that it, it, it was also a Western phenomenon. You know, half the book is about uh, the United, you know, illiberal democracy in America. But I have to be, uh, be honest, I thought these were kind of populist currents within America that I was warning about, that I felt were dangerous and, and you know, not particularly productive. But they were, they were at the realm of sort of trends that would, be, that would not threaten the American political system at all. I mean, I, I thought this was a case of, you know, we were, we were embracing too much the idea of the wisdom of the crowds and too much the idea of disintermediating political parties and things like that. If you remember, there's a section on the, uh, on referendums and why refer referendums are a bad idea and why we should actually do what we are supposed to do, which is delegate to representatives the, the, the act of, of governing. Um, I, I suppose I thought of it very much in the, in the populism in the West, I thought, was going to have the effect of demo, demosclerosis. Uh, as you know, I quote your book extravagantly in The Future of Freedom, uh, and because I thought it, it highlighted the sort of central problem that advanced industrial democracies had. And I was seeing this, this kind of populism and illiberalism feeding into the thing you were talking about, uh, the, the, the kind of Mansell Olson uh, problem. I did not imagine that it would threaten the democratic project itself. I did not think that it could rise to that level of discontent. Um, and I think that if, you know, what, what happened, you know, when I, what I say in a sense is where did, where did you and I not see this getting as serious as it did is if you read the final part of, uh, of Frank's uh, uh, end of history book, where he talks about the fundamental vulnerability of liberalism, and I'm sure he returns to this in his, in his new book, 
which is that it it doesn't stir the souls of men and women that we all are looking you know we are looking for something um to to, to you know to to uh to be proud of to live for to fight for to die for and that for some reason or the other people don't regard constitutional arrangements as that i say for some reason because i certainly think they are the most extraordinary things human beings have ever invented and we should be willing to sing their praises and and live and die for them but what stirs the souls of people is the idea of group loyalty of group animosity of group identity uh and that i you know that idea of you know that is what gives men chests in the in the metaphor that frank uh uses um and that's what all these guys have done right i mean they have they have uh, uh, these people have appealed whether it's orban uh the poles trump uh modi uh it's it's all this slightly atavistic group loyalty uh and that turns out to be sufficiently dangerous that it actually threatens the democratic project itself where where i thought the problem was we would end up with dysfunctional government uh you know kind of a certain kind of uh, uh, vulgarity both in culture and in politics uh, certain sclerosis and dysfunction but not what i think is quite conceivable which is an actual democratic decay uh, if not collapse i i wouldn't rate the possibility that high but i think if one were to say is there a 5 to 7% chance so 10% chance that you are we are entering a period where every election is going to be contested there is going to be people on the streets where legitimacy of elections are seriously in doubt um that's a pretty bad outcome to be to to, to be at and that seems to me where we are so john and free thank you for that exchange mark you have the floor Jeff, am I unmuted? You yes. are indeed. Ah, all right. Uh, a very good presentation for Reed. As you may know, I've been fascinated by the career of the term that you introduced, illiberal democracy, and uh, the way its usage has evolved over the years. And in your original article, it was a term of opprobrium. It was those countries who succeeded in having elections but otherwise were failing at um uh being democratic um but then it got picked up by Viktor Orban as a uh, slogan a positive slogan for what he was uh, was trying to build and of course there's been a lot of academic debate about is there such a thing as uh, a liberal democracy some people make the argument that these countries whether it's orban or modi and so on don't deserve the uh, term democracy of any kind that given what they uh, kinds of policies they've pursued and they're simply undemocratic and so i wanted to ask your view i don't know if you followed uh, these more academic debates um my own view is that such a thing does exist a liberal democracy and it's a form of regime but it's not a stable form of regime because i think over the longer run uh it will either become autocratic or it'll get rid of the strong man and possibly have some kind of return to democracy But I'm just interested in your thoughts on it. Yeah. Um, no, of course I follow them, Mark. I I remember your commentary on my original uh, on my original essay in Foreign Affairs, and then in the Journal of, of Democracy. Um, I, I think you, 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 look the important the reason why it's a bad idea to say these countries are not democratic is I understand the desire to say don't don't award them this you know don't give them this honor or. it it misses the point because analytically it's very important to to understand these regimes and they do have popular support and they do have popular participation and so it's very important to understand that it's precisely gets at the question azar was asking you right where where as as social scientists as observers as scholars we want to be we want to be able to make important distinctions and this is an important distinction 
governments that have political participation that uh, versus governments that don't. Uh, and then, you know, you, it, it shouldn't just be a badge democracy that is conferred on governments we like versus governments we don't like. And here, as you know, Mark, I'm drawing on Sam Huntington's famous distinction in the, in the third wave. I, I think the question you ask is the pivotal one. I don't know the answer to it. And it feels to me there are two possibilities. Because what you're saying is, look, ultimately, you can't keep this game going. They'll want to stay in power and they will become more and more liberal to the point where they essentially become autocracies because there is some limiting element to, you know, de the democratic feature of the government just means they can't keep going like this forever. Uh, and you're seeing this with Erdogan, right? Like Erdogan clearly is trying to figure out how to, trans how to turn the, the country into something like a quasi autocracy. How can he stay in power longer? How can his, his family now apparently all controls 5% of Turkey's GDP? You know, how do they, how do they expand this? I, I, I wonder whether you could actually maintain this balancing act for longer than people think, because back to this idea of these tribal affiliations, this group loyalty, uh, Erdogan is able to appeal, I'm using him now as an example, he's able to appeal to this, um, this group. Uh, there is on the other side a fractured opposition, which is kept fractured by a certain amount of manipulation and illiberal tactics. So you do have real elections, they are free and fair, but the, the deck is somewhat stacked against the opposition. And at the same time, you continue to, through patronage, through symbolism, uh, you continue to maintain your, you know, the core base, which is very large, right? So this is, you know, my theory of their ability to keep this going is based on the idea that uh, a, a lot of people are liberal. A lot of people are comfortable with the idea that if we get our share, um, we, are ha we don't care if the other people get screwed. And I'm thinking now, you know, frankly, of uh, Donald Trump's base, which clearly turns out not to be particularly, they don't care about free markets. They don't care about limited government. They don't, it turns out that so much of the Republican ideology was an elite ideology. The masses that were voting for it was, were like, if you give us subsidies, that's fine. And if you, you know, if you have a protectionist trade policies, that's fine, as long as they benefit us. Um, and so if that becomes the dynamic, then is it possible, you know, I'm thinking theoretically, is it possible for 60% of the population to permanently maintain an illiberal democracy that essentially disenfranchises in some significant way 40%? That would be the sense in which it would last. Uh, it, it would be possible to imagine this as a workable, stable model. Hmm. Interesting. So thank you, Mark. I'm gonna turn now to Nicole Penn and then Michael Allen, and in both cases, Take your time, but not too much time. We're nine minutes to go. Uh, hello, Dr. Zakaria. Thank you so much. I'm sorry I came late. My name is Nicole Penn. I'm a program manager at the American Enterprise Institute, and I'm on the editorial board here at American Purpose. Um, so apologies if you covered this during your presentation, but what I'm curious is to hear your thoughts on the extent to which preserving the liberal part of liberal democracy depends on a certain sublimation of the, the majority will. And, you know, in the United States, we have this institutionalized through um, our very structure of government. Um, so I'm wondering if, um, you know, the, for, for a democracy to remain liberal, does it have to have these very specific constructs that, you know, in many ways obstruct unrestricted majority rule? And if so, you know, if you see any way to to integrate in civic education, the idea that, and it's, again, it's not, it's not going to be something that perhaps gives men chess, but that you will not always be in the majority, because that is true. A person is, is multifaceted, has multiple different interests. I think it's something that we're obviously failing to inculcate in the United States, but, you know, is that just an insurmountable obstacle in, um, in non-Western countries? Thank you. Yeah, it's a great question. I did cover a bit of it, but you're absolutely right. Yeah, it, it is. Liberalism is fundamentally an anti-majoritarian project uh, because it is, or, or in a sense, it's a pre-majority. It, 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 the Bill of Rights, as I said, is essentially all limitations on majority rule. It's all, it's all or every single uh, part of it is saying, no matter what the majority wants to do, these are the things you can't do. 
that idea has been incorporated in most Western democracies, largely through the courts. You know, so we were the only one initially to have that. Now, if you look at the European Court of Justice, and if you look at, you know, Britain never had a Supreme Court, effectively it now has one. All the other Western democracies have it basically institutionalized this. Some of them don't function as well as they, as they should. So the Indian Supreme Court has actually the same powers that the US Supreme Court does, but it does not exercise them. Uh, partly for the reasons Frank was talking about, which is you are people are careful about asserting authority that they know cannot be actually fulfilled. You know, I mean, and again, we forget that this was true even in the United States when uh, the Supreme Court ruled that, uh, that, that Andrew Jackson could not send, uh, you know, had to send federal troops into Georgia to stop Georgia from appropriating Native American land. Uh, Jackson, uh, Andrew Jackson says, John Marshall has made his ruling. Now let him enforce it. Uh, and in fact, that ruling was never enforced and Georgia was able to confiscate all this uh, Cherokee land. So that's fundamental to the, to the idea. And I think you're right. One has to try to educate people that you know majorities are not always right. Um, it's a tough one because that also gives license to a certain kind of uh, anti-democratic you know, feeling. I mean, you, you, know, you, you hear this on the Republican side now sometimes uh, where people feel like, so what if we don't win elections? So what if we don't win the popular vote, right? So there is a balance, but I do think at the heart of the, of the liberal project, the way I'd like to put it is that the values that we are trying to uphold uh, transcend uh, the m majorities of the moment, that that's the way we should think about it. That the, 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 the ideals that we're trying to hold up, freedom of speech, freedom of thought, freedom of religion, uh, you know, freedom from unnecessary government uh, harassment, those things are so important that they should transcend the, the, the majority of the moment. Because we all know that in a moment, a majority will not be will not always be wise. In the long run, majority rule might be the best form of government, except all the others, as Churchill said. But in any given moment, majorities can be wrong. And that's why we want to, that's why, we, you know, we want to have some higher ideals. So thank you, Fred. Thank you, Nicole. Michael Allen, rudely I ask you, can you ask your question in 60 seconds or less? Yes. So I was struck by your comments about um, politically partisan extremist driving polarization and dysfun democratic dysfunction, precisely because Martin Conway's recent book on uh, democratic renewal in Western Europe makes the point that it was precisely the experience of interwar Europe being driven by politically partisan extreme, my, extremist minorities that led the constitutional architects of post-war Western Europe, continental Europe that is, to deliberately constrain democratic institutions in order to protect liberalism. One of the ways in which they did that was by enhancing the importance of intermediate institutions. So the way you might call group identity and so on were channeled through, in essence, corporatist bodies. Of course, the United States has a radically different political constitution and radically different political culture. But do you think there are any institution, forms of institutional innovation or reform that might help um, in a sense, address the US democratic dysfunction in a similar fashion. The most interesting uh, difference between Europe and the United States right now is the strength of European political parties. It's not true everywhere, but if you look at Germany, what is striking is that Germany is probably the most stable, politically stable country in Europe right now. And it's partly because they still have pretty large, stable political parties. Uh, and those parties are not populist, by which I mean they are internally undemocratic. Uh, they do have no primary system. There is no process by which Twitter chooses the next leader of the, of the SDP or the CDU. Th that is done by party elites. And it is therefore, they, they perform that gatekeeping function. Now this used to historically be true in America. And this was one of the uh, illiberal features that I decried in Future of Freedom. I didn't like the, the way in which the parties were being hollowed out. So at this point, part, political parties are meaningless in America. Uh, when people say the Republican Party didn't stand up to Donald Trump, 
it's kind of a meaningless comment because there is no Republican Party. The Republican Party is a shell. It is a shell within which the person with the loudest megaphone, the best Rolodex, and the greatest ability to attract uh, votes wins. And that happened to be Donald Trump. So he took over the party. But that, you know, it happened to be Barack Obama four years earlier, and he took over the Democratic Party. The Democrats have a little bit more of that gatekeeping function. They were able to, for example, keep Bernie Sanders from getting the nomination, in my opinion, a good thing, uh, because they were fulfilling that gatekeeper function of not allowing the most, you know, Twitter to decide who was going to be the, uh, the, 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 the candidate. So there's that function, but don't, don't kid yourself. Everywhere this, this, these institutions are under stress. The CDU and the SPD used to get 90% of the vote in Germany regularly. Um, in this election, uh, the, those two main parties got 50% of the vote. So everywhere, what you are seeing is this great dissatisfaction at a time of enormous change, which translates into great dissatisfaction with these institutions, uh, which translates into a search for alternatives, newcomers, particularly radical newcomers coming about. The one institutional reform that would help American democracy, I can say it with absolute confidence because it will never be enacted, is proportional representation of some kind. You know, in other words, ranked choice voting or something that allows people's actual preferences to be reflected, which we have now, we have a very strange political system that really locks out, you know, a lot of the preferences. So if you think about it in this way, you know, California, the most liberal state in the, in the union has about 40% 40, 40 of California, which is tens of millions of people who are very conservative, whose views are nowhere represented, right? Similarly in New York, Texas has 45% liberals who are never represented. We have no mechanism to allow the losers in a simple two-party contest in a two-way you know, two binary vote to be heard. And if we could have a political system, a voting system that allowed that, perhaps that would, that would get rid of some of this anger, but it's not gonna happen. So as I say, I can confidently predict that it would be the magic solution. So Michael, thank you. And Fried, thank you very much. First of all, in closing, my apologies to Don Emerson and other colleagues who've waited patiently. Come again soon. Watch us, listen, read. Read, by the way, tomorrow, Larry Diamond on some of these questions pertaining to the strength and resiliency of American democracy, in particular in reference to three elections for governor in 2022. Keep reading and watching always, Fareed, if you would turn your cameras on just to say goodbye, if you're in a position to do so, I want to thank you, Fareed, for your valuable time, for a stimulating and challenging conversation. And as guest of honor, I'd be happy to offer you a final word or concluding thoughts. Well, I just want to say this is an amazing group that you've put together. Um, easily the high, most high-powered group I've, I've had a discussion with about, about these issues in a long, long time. And uh, it's a huge pleasure to do it, and it's an honor. Thank you, Free. Thanks, everybody, for making time. Have a great afternoon, great evening. Thank you so much.